Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Apocrypha Apocalypse. I'm Gary Machuto. I want to address today a topic that we, we touched on tangentially in other videos, but I came across some new evidence that I think is very important, and that is the use of First Maccabees to discount the Deuterocanon. And this is a huge rhetorical objection made by opponents of the Deuterocanon in print, on the web, and in debate. These three texts from 1 Maccabees, 1 Maccabees 4, 46, 9, 27, and 14, 41, are often adduced as proof that the Deuterocanon can't be scripture. And it's often said, for example, that these texts deny that there was a prophet during the time of the Maccabees, and therefore it was impossible for inspired writings to be written. And another tack, too, that's used is that these very same verses are used in support of the cessation of prophecy theory, which is this theory that the, uh, the spirit of prophecy departed from Israel with the last prophets of the proto-canon, and it was not to return until the advent of Christ. And so uh, this, these texts have this, um, are used for these two purposes. And in debates and in my videos, I gave some very good reasons to believe that this simply isn't true. And uh, you can check that out on the channel. Just go to the search engine, type in cessation of prophecy, sit uh, on the this internal search, and you'll find those videos that I put out. But uh, recently, I've been going over some of my older sources. And it's funny how you miss things, you forget things, or sometimes like all the pieces come together. And that's what happened for me. And I realized that there is a great response that can be given that totally obliterates both of those proofs. And now here's the ironic thing. I found it in a standard theological dictionary, a Protestant theological dictionary, where it puts all the pieces together and gave me this eureka moment. So I want to share that with you. So fasten your seatbelts, folks, because the apocalypse begins right now. Okay, so what about this trio of verses? First Maccabees 4, 46, 9, 27, 14, 41. What do they represent? Are they talking about a time where the Maccabean period was utterly devoid of prophets and prophecy, therefore there couldn't be any prophetic books written? Uh, actually, I think that is very dubious, and there's very good counter evidence that that connection is not real. It's not biblical. But putting that aside for the moment, do these verses support a, a permanent cessation of prophets and prophecy up until the coming of Christ, as the cessation of prophecy theory purports? By the way, we've done a series, I've mentioned this before, on the cessation of prophecy theory. I've gone through uh, uh, the evidence, both for and against, in multiple videos. All you have to do is go to a search engine, look on this channel, type in cessation of prophecy, check those out. I really should put them into a playlist. I just haven't had time to organize the videos on this channel, but I'll get to it, God willing. Um, so over the years, uh, this is a staple in typical apologetics against the Deuteral canon. And my answer had been uniformly that if you look closely at the text, at least two of the three cited, it's very clear that it actually speaks against this cessation of prophecy in terms of from Artaxerxes all the way to uh, uh, the time of Christ or even the first century. For example, in 1 Maccabees 4.46, which reads, they stored the stones in a suitable place on the temple hill until a prophet should come and decide what to do with them. And also in 1441, it says the Jewish people and their priests have therefore made the following decisions. Simon shall be the permanent leader and high priest until a true prophet arises. Now, what I've pointed out is that if you interpret these texts, in light of their surrounding context, or not even looking at the context, it's clear that there is an expectation that a prophet will indeed arise. This isn't just hoping and praying that somehow a prophet would pop out of nowhere. Uh, 
the whole idea is that we're making decisions now conditional upon the arrival of a prophet or a true prophet. I think the inference is that this prophet is expected to arise within their lifetime, sometimes very soon. And so you don't see this permanent cessation of prophets and prophecy at work here. Actually, you see the opposite. You see an expectation that a prophet will arise. Now, somebody might say, well, that prophet was to come at the end of an age or the beginning of a new age, maybe at the end of time, an eschatological prophet. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But nevertheless, it shows that they were expecting a prophet to come any day. So the question is, is this a permanent cessation of prophecy starting way back uh, with Artaxerxes to the Maccabean period and, and afterwards? Or is this just a temporary condition that the Maccabees are experiencing? I think just the plain meaning of the text shows it's temporary. Now, I've I always had the sense that, and I don't think anybody's ever formally come against me, but that people feel that this is uh, just trying to explain away the force of the argument. But I think this program today, I, I think kind of puts a pin in that possibility. And I think first Maccabees actually gives us a profit. But before we do that, I want to explain a little bit more about the background for the information I'm going to give in this video. As you know, I, I'm always going through old information. I'm always checking, rechecking sources. I'm going over older sources that I've used in the past. Because let's face it, when it comes to the issue of the Old Testament canon, there are many different facets, many different levels, many different disciplines. And quite frankly, if you aren't constantly reading and rereading sources and thinking this through and trying to integrate everything together, uh, it's very easy to get lost and swamped in the details. So while I was looking at one of my sources that I, I think I may have even quoted in a debate a long time ago, is a standard Protestant dictionary. In fact, this is a venerable standard Protestant dictionary. I think most Protestant pastors worth their salt probably have the set of this dictionary on their shelves. And that is the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, probably better known by its chief editor, Gerhard Kittel. So many times they'll refer to the set as Kittel. That's how venerable it is. It actually has a nickname. And uh, I picked this up early in my apologetic career. I've used it with a uh, I've read it. It's helped me a lot with Greek, and there's lots of good insights. And the articles are pretty much like any compilation of articles. Some entries are better than others. But nevertheless, overall, I think it's a very good, solid work. And, and there's a good reason that pretty much everybody who's serious about exegesis has uh, repaired to Kittle at some point in their career. Anyway, as I was reviewing the article on prophecy, prophetess, I noticed that there is a subsection that I remember reading a long time ago, but for some reason, it just didn't click. I didn't really see the import of it until I was rereading it, and it really helped me firm up my understanding. And what it does is it goes through the narrative and the whole context of 1 Maccabees and shows how these three proof texts they are often cited as proof for the cessation of prophecy theory, actually is not good at all. In fact, my original interpretation of these texts is, I think, supported by the overall context. Again, this is not me. This is not a Catholic resource. I'm not quoting a Catholic apologist. I'm quoting Kittle, okay? <laughs> so now here's the bad part. I would love to take this text from Kittle and reproduce it for the video. But obviously, that would be an infringement on copyright. I wouldn't want to do that. So I'm just going to have a couple of fair use quotations, and I'll try to summarize what this article says. And for those who have it and you want to read the whole thing, just open up Kittle, volume six, page 815, 815. And it goes on through, I think, 816, maybe 817, but you'll see it. It's under the subsection E, particular note should be taken of 1st Maccabees 4, 46, 9, 27, and 1441. That's the subtitle. I just start reading from there. So I'll do my best to summarize what's in this article. I'll give you a couple of quotes from the article, and then we'll talk a little bit about the implications of this in terms of apologetics and the use of these texts against the Deuterocanon. Okay, so 
what this article does is it shows that, interesting enough, these three proof texts come at different parts in the narrative of 1st Maccabees. The first quote, 1st Maccabees 446, this comes after, it's actually a high point in the narrative because the narrative has high and low points all the way through this revolt. And so this is actually a high point where the temple altar is being reconstituted, reconstructed. And there's a problem because you have divine instructions as to how to construct and consecrate an altar, but you don't have any instructions, no divine instructions as to what to do if you need to get rid of a defiled altar. In other words, you have altar stones and, and so on that has been defiled. What do you do with these stones? So that's where 1 Maccabees 4.46 comes in, which reads, they stored the stones in a suitable place on the temple hill until a prophet should come and decide what to do with them. In other words, since there wasn't presently a prophet on the scene, and they don't have any divine instruction in writing what to do with a defiled temple uh, or defiled altar or cultic instruments or anything like that. It was decided just simply to place them in a special place and wait for a prophet to come so they could tell what to do with these things. So God can give them instructions. Again, I think the inference there is, well, obviously they're expecting a prophet to arrive on the scene fairly close, you know, within uh, a short amount of time. So currently there's no prophet on the scene, but there's the expectation that one will come on the scene. And this takes place in 164 BC, by the way. So that opens up attention in the first Maccabean narrative. What are we to do with the defiled stones? When is this prophet going to come that will be able to tell us what to do with the stones? that tension starts to creep in. And from there, the Maccabean narrative starts going down. It, it gets darker and darker until we reach the nadir of the narrative. And in a real way, 1 Maccabees 9.27, that second proof text, takes uh, is spoken of at the lowest point, the darkest period in the revolt, because that passage happens in the context of where Judas Maccabeus, the leader of the Maccabean revolt, gets killed in 160 BC. And that's where it reads as follows. There had not been such great distress in Israel since the time prophets ceased to appear among the people. Okay, so that speaks about this great distress that's happening here because the, the leader of the Maccabean revolt has been killed. So this is the low point. Okay. Now, interesting enough, what happens is with the death of Judas, then the narrative picks up and we start rising again to another climax. Pent's ultimate climax comes in 1441, the third proof text, because it's there that Simon is appointed both leader and high priest. So now you not only have a leader, but you also have a, a priestly leader in the person of Simon. So two of the three offices are combined and constituted. And so let me read 1 Maccabees 1441. Again, this is that third proof text that's usually given against the Deuteronomy canon. It says the Jewish people and their priests have therefore made the following decisions. Simon shall be their permanent leader and high priest until a true prophet arises. And this takes place in 141 BC. And here I'm going to give a short quote from Kittle where he summarizes. He says, quote, from this, it is concluded on the one side that the national decision should be in force until the extinguished prophetic gift should be kindled again in an authentic bearer of the spirit and should perhaps call for a constitutional change. Okay, so we're going to constitute the Maccabean government with Simon as both leader and priest or high priest until a prophet, a true prophet should come. And maybe the true prophet will reconstitute how the constitution of the, the, the government is. Okay. And Kittle continues, he says, well, on the other, there is seen behind first Maccabees 1441, the expectation of an eschatological prophet 
who would come forth as prophetis pustos? In other words, a true prophet, a faithful prophet. What is an eschatological prophet? Eschatological prophet means an end time prophet. Now, this could be an end of a period, an end of an age. It could refer to uh, like the messianic age, maybe. So he opens up that here we, we have the expectation of uh, the, the prophetic gift will be rekindled. An authentic bearer of the spirit may reconstitute it, but until then, it's going to be permanent that Simon is high priest and leader. And also it notes that in 1 Maccabees 14.41, Perhaps this, this prophet would be signaling a new age, uh, eschatological prophet. Now, what's really interesting is the very next line in Kittle, in the next paragraph, it starts with this line. It says, the general trend of First Maccabees, which is in essentials a single unit, is against any such long-range expectation. In other words, don't think when it says an eschatological prophet that this is a prophet that's going to be taking place hundreds and hundreds of years later with, say, in the time of Christ, okay? It actually says that, no, the expectation is that this prophet, this true prophet, is going to arrive pretty soon on the scene. Again, if there was a cessation of prophecy that happened way back in the time of Artaxerxes and has persisted through centuries and it won't come back until after, long after Judas Maccabeus, this just doesn't make sense. So I totally agree with Kittle that this is not a long range expectation. This is contemporary. So we still have this tension that's raised way back in 1 Maccabees 446 with the altar stones. We're going to put them aside. We're going to wait for a prophet to come. And then the tension grows because now Judas Maccabeus is dead. Now, uh, the whole country is in peril. There is terror. And then you have Simon temporarily reconstituting. And he's a high priest, so he has authority to make cultic changes to decide what to do with these defiled instruments that were once consecrated. But he's not a prophet. So th there's still that tension there. When is this tension resolved? Well, again, for those who use these texts, uh, against the Deuterocanon and for the cessation of prophecy, it shouldn't be resolved in 1 Maccabees or 2 Maccabees. It shouldn't resolve until, let's say, John the Baptist comes on the scene or something like that. There shouldn't be a resolution. However, it is resolved in 1 Maccabees. Why? Because there is a new leader that arises. And what's interesting with him is his name is John Harkanis. I've heard it pronounced a couple of ways that I'm just going to call it Hercanus just because that's how I always pronounced it. It's probably wrong though, but please bear with me if it is. Um, and what's interesting about John is that he unites in himself the three historic offices of priest, king, and prophet all in one. In other words, he's kind of a foreshadowing of the Messiah who would be the anointed one, who would be uh, king, priest, and prophet together. So he's kind of, in a way, a type of Christ, a Christ figure. It's the rival here in 1 Maccabees 16 that we finally have that tension resolved in 1 Maccabees. They're waiting for this to come. Finally, it does come with John Harkanis. So this leaves us with two possible interpretations of the verse. And this is how the article from Kittle ends. Now, I'm going to quote here. I think this is within fair use. So we'll give it a quote. It says, if 1 Maccabees 9.27 refers to the time when a prophet last appeared, now after the days of affliction and conflict, a prophet has appeared again, and thus the age of salvation has come. Now, of course, it's using salvation in the term of a temporal deliverance. Okay, obviously, uh, John doesn't take away sins or anything any more than any other high priest in the Old Covenant. Okay, so if... 1 Maccabees 9.27 refers to uh, a time that where the, the prophets last appeared. In other words, that it was in Babylon that prophets ceased, which, of course, can't be true. And so I think this is not true. But anyway, he says, uh, well, now that situation has changed. So even if you interpret these three verses to believe in a cessation of prophecy that starts with, Xerxes and continues on, well, guess what? 
that ends, the cessation of prophecy ends in 1 Maccabees 16. Why? Because you have uh, John Harkanis, who is priest, prophet, and king. Now, if you're just reading the text of 1 Maccabees, it ends on this note about John. Now, to us readers, thousands of years after the fact, totally outside of this context, this John doesn't seem very important, although apparently it was important to the writer of 1 Maccabees, because he says, quote, the rest of the history of John, his wars and his brave deeds he performed, his rebuilding of the walls and other achievements, these things are recorded in the chronicles of his pontificate from the time that he succeeded his father as high priest. And that's where 1 Maccabees ends. So who is this John? And why is he important? Well, ironically, we learn about this John from none other than the first century Jewish historian, Flavius Josephus, where Flavius Josephus tells us more about the unique character of John in that John held to the three anointed offices of Israel. He was the leader, so there's a kingly office. He was high priest, so he held a priestly office. And he also held the prophetic office as well. In fact, he even prophesies. So Flavius Josephus mentions John Harkanus in two of his works, one on the Jewish wars, and that is book one, paragraphs 68 and 69, and also his Antiquities of the Jews, which is book 13, uh, paragraphs 298 through 300. So let's read what Josephus has to say about John Harkanus, this individual that shows up at the very end of 1 Maccabees. In the Jewish Wars 168 through 69, it says, quote, For the rest of his days, John lived in prosperity, and after excellently directing the government for 31 year, whole years, died leaving five sons. Truly a blessed individual and one who left no ground for complaint against fortune as regards himself. He was the only man to unite in his person three of the highest privileges, the supreme command of the nation. Again, that's the kingly office, the high priesthood, and the gift of prophecy. So you have kingly, priestly, and prophetic. For so closely was he in touch with the deity that he was never ignorant of the future. Thus he foresaw and predicted that his two elder sons would not remain at the head of affairs. The story of their downfall is worth relating and will show how great was the decline from their father's good fortune. So that is from Jewish Wars, Book 1, 68-69. In his Antiquities of the Jews in Book 13, 299 to 300. Now, the Jewish Wars, that's from the Curse of Lake translation. Fortunately, uh, we have to use the Wiston translation for Antiquities. Um, starting in 299, it says this, quote, But when Harkanus had put an end to this sedition, he, after that, lived happily and administered the government in the best manner for 31 years, and then died, leaving behind him five sons. He was esteemed by God worthy of the three privileges, the government of the nation, the dignity of the high priesthood, and prophecy. For God was with him and enabled him to know fortuities, and to foretell this in particular, that as his two eldest sons, he foretold that they would not long continue in the government of public affairs, whose unhappy catastrophe will be worth our description, that we may thence learn how very much they were inferior to their father's happiness. So we have two different texts where Josephus is expounding on this John mentioned at the very end of 1 Maccabees, and he singles them out as holding that threefold office in a way, kind of a precursor of the Messiah who holds the three anointed offices of kingly, priestly, and uh, prophetic offices. Well, John Harkanis actually held that. Not only did he hold the prophetic office, but he had prophecy as well. 
in fact, Josephus says that he had conversations with the deity. And he also recounts twice in both sources um, his prediction that his sons would not last in the leadership of the people in terms of public affairs. And apparently this is a true prophecy, as Josephus recounts, which is interesting because that shows that Josephus and apparently a lot of other Jews around roughly about AD 100, he wrote this, that it was well known amongst the Jews that he held these three offices, that he held a prophetic office, and also that he gave prophecies that were well known enough for him to recount. So for Josephus, there's no doubt at all that John Harkanus is a prophet and held a prophetic office and actually gave predictive prophecy. Now, here's the most remarkable thing of all is if you're familiar with the things on this channel and you've been following this channel, you know Flavius Josephus is probably the most important uh, person in antiquity for the idea of the cessation of prophecy. Josephus comes to the head of the list, and it's often said that he said that after Artaxerxes, no more prophets, no more prophecy. And if you look at the works of Josephus, you find out that he doesn't call a lot of people prophets after that period. In fact, uh, he only calls uh, Cleodemus, actually quoting from Polyester, is called a prophet, and John Harkanus is called a prophet. Those are the only two instances where an individual is called by Josephus prophet. So how could there be a cessation of prophecy way back in our Xerxes when you have John Harkanus who's giving prophecy and holding a prophetic office? Hence, uh, like I said, Josephus, I think, is helpful in that by recounting this prophecy, the fact that he held these three offices, I think signals that it probably was common knowledge. This isn't something unique to Josephus. And if it was common knowledge in the first century, then I think the original readers of 1 Maccabees certainly would be familiar with John Harkanus and his gift of prophecy. And why is this important again? Well, we go back to that article in Kittle, because what Kittle points out is that those tensions that are raised by those verses that are commonly cited against the Deuterocanon in 1 Maccabees is resolved at the end with the advent of John. And of all people, Josephus backs that up with his testimonies. Surprise, surprise. So, um, so yeah, I thought this was worth putting a video together just because uh, I ran across this article in Kittle and uh, it's very interesting stuff. So uh, throw it out there for you. And until next week, uh, I hope everybody has a great week. And by the way, if you like this channel, please subscribe, hit the thumbs up. And if you'd like to support myself or William Albrecht, because uh, your funding helps us to get resources that are very expensive. Uh, and we, so we re really appreciate that you support us. Uh, you can support us on Patreon as well. So until, until next time, I'm Gary Machuda. Take care. Bye-bye.